Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. You'll hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and writers that cover the NFL on a daily basis. The New Orleans Saints podcast starts right now. Here's your host, Aaron Summers. Yeah, it's been one of those two days. Seems like two weeks a little bit. I'm not, you know, not going to lie to you. Um, just a lot going on. I mean, obviously, when uh, when you have a, a change in, in position, right, there's there's things that uh, you got to change in your daily schedule. Listen, coaches are, are routine guys now, I'm, and I'm, I'm guilty. Guilty is charged in being a routine guy. And so uh, my personal routine's got to had to change up. And so I'm uh, just trying to figure out the best way to you know do things. Uh, I thought it was really tr- important to try to communicate with, with just about everybody in the building. Um, most importantly, the players, and, and then obviously the coaches and the staff, and just making sure everybody's on the same page. You know, we made some changes on the daily schedule, we made some changes on the practice schedule, um, and so you know, you just got to make sure that you know, we've been doing things uh, around here the same way, or at least similar, for a long time. And, and I thought it was important to maybe just uh, get a little change of pace. And so uh, we have a lot of people in the building um, that have been here for a while and have been doing that. And so just a lot, just been doing a lot of that, a lot of schedule stuff. Obviously, dealing with our personnel, and, and then and at the end of the day, we got a game plan. So, just trying to make sure that uh, we have enough time for all that. So, um, <clears throat> but listen, I'm uh, like I said the other day, uh, certainly up for the challenge, and uh, we'll be there Sunday. Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. I'm Aaron Summers. It was the first day officially on the job for Darren Rizzi as he held his first practice as interim head coach. He said that he has switched up a lot of different things from the layout of the locker room, the practice schedule, the format of the practice itself. He's added an activation period for the players to warm up a little bit differently before practice starts. He's even asked them to change where they sit in the meeting rooms. I guess just a f- different feel, different vibe. Uh, here we are in the second half of the year. We had a you know a little mo- major change at the top, and just want want to feel a little different for everybody, and want to keep everybody kind of on their toes and antenna up. And that was the thought process behind it, and with with a lot of the things we're doing. Quarterback Derek Carr said the change is nice. It's a little refreshing at this point in the season when you're on a seven-game losing streak to mix it up, and they hope that it all translates to the field on Sunday. With Riz today, he wanted to change perspectives in the meeting rooms. He's like, sit by a new teammate tomorrow. You know, like just change your perspective in the room. You know, just all that kind of stuff. And so he just, he's doing all these kind of things. And, and us as players, right now, we love it. And, uh, you know, it does, it does feel different. And hopefully, hopefully it just results to wins because, like, we can feel good all we want and, like, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, like our city needs a winner. And so hopefully that's what it produces. Rizzi also made some coaching changes on the defensive side, moving Todd Grantham, who oversaw the defensive line, to a senior assistant role where he will help Joe Woods, since Woods is now going to be having to call the plays every week. This will help take some of what Woods' former responsibilities were off his plate, and Grantham will help him out there. For the defensive line, then, Brian Young moves up to oversee the defensive line. Rizzi also hired Marwan Malouf, who will help out with special teams, since Rizzi is now taking on a little more responsibility elsewhere. Speaking of that responsibility, Rizzi said that it was really important for him to dive into the offensive and defensive side of the ball. I think one of the things that's really important to me is how we go out there and play as a team, and we have a we, we're not just we're not three separate units. We we, we need cohesion, and I just want to and, and listen. I'm not going to be sitting there and telling Clint what plays to run. I'm not. I'm not going to be sitting there and telling Joe what defense to run. I'm not. But also, I think we want to play team football. I think that's one of the things. I think I mentioned maybe the other day, I don't think we've played complementary football. We had good special teams games, and maybe the other two phases didn't play well. Or we had good offensive games and, and vice versa. We really haven't played complementary football since the Dallas game. That's just, you know, in, the, in this seven-game stretch, we've had peaks and valleys in, in, in all three phases. And so... That's really my message, and just making sure we're all on the same page. Like, how do we want to play this game? We don't want to play it, you know, the offense, you play it this way, the defense, you play it this way, and special teams, you play it this way. We want, we want to play it together as a team. And so one of my messages to the team today is, is this is how we will win the game against the Falcons, and this is how we could potentially lose the game, and let's everybody be on the same page with how we're going to attack this game as a team. And then we break it down to the, to the individual phases. For practice participation, first day of week 10, there was no Cedric Wilson, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Chris Olave, or Lucas Patrick at practice. Here is Rizzy on Chris Olave. 
this is it's going to sound a little bit like coach speak, but it's really not. This is really what he's doing. We're kind of taking this day by day. He's, he's he wants to go thoroughly through the process and making sure he's making the, the best decision for Chris Olave. Got to remove football from that equation in the beginning of it, and what's the best decision for the person? And so, um, listen, my my conversations with him and our medical staff have been, you know, we're going to kind of be thorough. He's going to be kind of thorough, and his family's going to be thorough with the process. I completely support that. Um, like I said, I have five of uh, five kids of my own, and so if, if that was one of my kids, I would I would want to do the same thing. I'm, we're we're more worried about Chris Olave, the person at the moment, and making sure that everything's good, and then. Once he goes through that process, then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it back to football and see how that fits in. So that's when I say it's a day to day. It's not like I said. I know it sounds like sounds like coach speak. It's really not. It's how, how we're doing. So he's kind of seeing some specialists and doing some things and kind of going through the process. And I, I certainly encourage that. For today's guest, we're bringing in the voice of the Falcons, Wes Durham, to help break down how things have been going in Atlanta and give us a little perspective on an interim head coaching situation and a coaching change in the future. Wes, thank you so much for joining me on the New Orleans Saints podcast. It is always fun to have you, although I don't think any of us look forward to Saints Falcons week. <laughs> How are you? I'm great, Aaron. And you know what? I, I look, I kind of like this because as I tell people after, no, this is year 21 doing the Falcons. And I, I tell this to a lot of people who ask me about doing, you know, I've been blessed to do Saturdays for so long and do Sundays now for 21 years. And people say, well, God, what's the difference in the college and the NFL? And I said, well, you know, fan bases are unique, stuff like that. I said, but every once in a while, you run into one where you get a full college feel of an NFL series. And this is the one for me. Falcons and Saints has got all the college vibes to it. It's got passionate fan base. Each environment is different. Uh, the fans go to each other's city when the game takes place. And you know what? They don't like each other. Mm -hmm. Just like college. <laughs> I mean, you know, true. <laughs> we need to play for. I, I jokingly said this the week of the uh, game we had earlier this year. I said we probably ought to find a way to play for something. You know, like the trophy or something. Now the league would lose their mind, but I, sure. I do think that you know it would be kind of cool if somebody came up with. So I, I will say this: I think the one thing that shows the passion of the fan base is the 50-50 raffle that's taken place now the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think that is an amazing uh, philanthropic thing, not only to visit to benefit ALS and research and in honor of Tim and Steve, but at the same time, it shows you the passion of the fan base. Yeah. And, and that is cool. So if that's our trophy, then I guess we're good. Yeah, that's a great cause and a, and a great – trophy i guess quote unquote that yeah. we can have at least <laughs> i know you're from carolina guy the victory bell between you know carolina and duke like, and their football oh yeah teams. so it would be kind of fun to do something i don't know yeah. maybe we can toss the ideas around yeah they haven't played they they were in existence a year apart i mean falcon 66 saints were 67 i think um you know there's so much symmetry between the two marketplaces and mm -hmm. things like that and seemingly you know like i said the fans go back and forth so it is fun for sure this one is going to be a little bit different, especially mm -hmm. on the Saints side, as they have moved on from head coach Dennis Allen and now have interim head coach Darren Rizzi, a special teams coordinator, stepping in. You've been through this with a coach taking over, yep, not yep. quite this deep into a season, but in 2020 when Dan Quinn was let go, it was Raheem Morris who stepped in the next game out. It was a, a bloodbath, really, for the Vikings. The Falcons yeah. came out and and kick their butt 40 to 23. Yeah. Are any, anybody over there in the Falcons side, are they nervous about maybe the energy oh, that the saints are going to come into this game with? Absolutely. I think, I think you have to know that, you know, there is, there's two thoughts psychologically, the way this works and anytime it's happened and look, I was in it for 13 games in 2007 when Bobby Petrino left to go to Arkansas and Emmett Thomas, who was a, NFL Hall of Famer was the senior defensive assistant of the team, and ET took the team for the final three games of the regular season. Now, they didn't win any of those games, but the competitive level of the team was ratcheted up, right? A couple mm -hmm. of notches. Uh, to your point about Ra's first game in Minnesota after DQ was let go five games into the 20 campaign, let me tell you, dynamically, Atlanta changed. I mean, they changed just from a momentum standpoint, from a uh, – it felt more collaborative going down the stretch, things of that nature. So in that, in those last, you know, uh, those last 11 games, 
for the most part until injuries set in and things of that nature. You know, Raheem did a really, really good job. And it, and in some small way, this is going to sound very granular, in some small way, Aaron, he set the table to win probably the job or at least have a pretty solid interview leading into this job. So for me, I think it's going to be interesting to watch New Orleans early. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the injuries are the injuries. And I was comparing my chart from the first game to my chart from the second game. And the trade of Marshawn Lattimore aside, I mean, like Paulson Adebo's done. There, I mean, it's just a, it's kind of a different, even looking football team across the front. Um, you've obviously had the injuries on offense too. I mean, mm -hmm. you've had banged up guys in the offensive line seemingly since week one. Uh, there's been guys in and out of the receiving core. Uh, the Shahid injury to me is a twofold because not only was he a terrific slot guy for what Carr wanted to do in the pass game, I thought he was electric in returns. Yeah. And so, you know, when you get over that hump, then it becomes how this football team's going to react. And, you know, we were talking before we started about kind of the infrastructure beyond Darren Rizzi. Sometimes these changes occur Two, three guys also go out the door at the head coach in this particular case, nobody else is gone. So the passion of the players combined with the connectivity of the staff will be really critical. I think to the way new Orleans plays on Sunday and in all honesty, here we go again, it's saints Falcons expect the unexpected. And so that's kind of where I am. And I think that's where a lot of people at flowery branch are this week as it relates to what they're going to see at the Superdome on Sunday. Sure, this, the Falcons, they come in six and three, won five of their last six, though. Yeah, how yeah. are they different? How have they improved since we last saw them? Um, It's a good question. I think that, believe it or not, there's certain pieces of this football team that are the same. And they are methodically or very disciplined in their approach to getting better. Now, I will tell you this, I think, and this won't come as a surprise to New Orleans fans because he had a pretty good game. Darnell Mooney's been an impact guy here and, you know, and I give all the credit to Terry Fontenot and Ryan Pace and Kyle Smith on the, on the administrative side, because they identified a guy who opposite Drake London could be an impact guy. And so Mooney has continued to progress and he's had big catches, third down, fourth down catches, uh, the fourth down touchdown last week. Um, for me, I think Kyle Pitts is playing better. Now it's, it's not consistent. It's not five or more catches every game. It's not, you know, a hundred yards every other game, but Kyle has become much more comfortable. I think in what Zach Robinson's trying to do. The second thing that's going to come out of this, I'm afraid is the run game has now started to really build momentum and Atlanta's running the ball. Now that challenge will be interesting with new Orleans, because I think that's an area where if Atlanta can generate run game, it presents problems in the past game. And so for me, offensively, they've done those type things. Defensively, um, you know, knock on wood, if you're a Falcons fan, they've been pretty sure tacklers. They continue to play off defensively a little bit. That'll be interesting with Derek Carr now back and seemingly pretty close to health. Um, but the back end, uh, they've started to make plays. And last Saturday, Sunday, they had three sacks, mm -hmm. which was half of the total they had had through the first however many games. So, you know, we'll see how this goes, but I'm expecting this thing to be Saints Falcons on Sunday and, you know, administration of the coaching staff aside, I, I fully expect it to be close. Yeah. Anybody's game with a minute to go, the Saints may have the lead and then a 58 yard field goal. Oh yeah. Well, there's that, right. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, that part just goes to show you how, and you know, Will Lutz want to share games in Atlanta too. So it happens every time with every kicker. So we'll see what happens here on Sunday. But yeah, if it comes down to a field goal, certainly Atlanta feels pretty good with Koo in that building who's kicked a game winner already in his career for sure. Mm -hmm. With Bijan Robinson and his ability to be such a impactful player in the pass game as well, yeah. and not even that, but his yards after catch have been incredible yeah. this year he's doing so well in that regard how dynamic is he and, and how much more maybe can they use him well last Sunday was his career high in touches he had 19 carries and seven catches right so he touched it 26 times last last week and I think impacted the game in a lot of different ways I, I your question though I don't think we've seen him yet run something vertical, truly vertical in the pass game. Um, and I don't know that I've seen it in practice either. So it's not like I'm talking about something could be hatched Sunday, 
but it could, I guess. Um, I think he is a guy who can punctuate the game late. I think he can impact the game early. And the yards after catch thing does happen because of his elusiveness. And in some ways, Aaron, everybody gets caught up in talking about what Bajan is as a ball carrier or a receiver. The number one thing that that sets him apart, I think, from a lot of other guys is his elusiveness, period. I mean, I think he's the best make-you-miss guy in the league. Um, now, he's not Saquon Barkley who jumps over people backwards. But, Gosh, I mean, I yeah. But I, but I do believe his his elusiveness is probably the one characteristic that I think he carries every day on every touch. You've covered the Falcons for a while, so you've seen the Saints a lot. Mm-hmm. How impressed have you been with Alvin Kamara, speaking of another dynamic dual threat yeah. back? Yeah, uh, he's terrific. And I had a chance to see him in high school when he played for Keith Maloof at Norcross. And I thought then... He was a top-end guy from a speed perspective. I thought his ability to shed tacklers was really good. And then, you know, he gets to the college level and starts making an impact there. And then I was one of those guys. And there, there are a handful. You got a couple guys on your roster right now who, like, when they end up in New Orleans, I'm like, no, not New Orleans, not there. Come on. <laughs> but when you know, when when Camara ended up there, I thought, you know what? the way that at the time Pete Carmichael drew plays and now certainly with Clint Kubiak, that's the kind of offense where Kamara can be a showcase piece. And look, let's be honest. I think we all understand the physical punishment he's taken in the last couple of years has probably, you know, slid him down a little bit, but he keeps coming back. And I respect that a ton. Um, I also think it's fascinating that a kid who I thought had a really good career going in Detroit after being in green Bay, uh, I really like Jamal Williams. Now I did a game in college at Georgia Tech when I was still doing radio there where Jamal Williams came in as a freshman from San Antonio, Texas, and had 120 yards for BYU in a game in Atlanta. I've always liked Jamal Williams, and I thought Kamara and Williams would be just a hell of a combination, especially given the receivers that uh, New Orleans had at the time. So, you know, I, I think there's still obviously – some symmetry there at some point, but Camara, to your point, has been just unbelievable. And it, yeah. I think some of that struggle too, Aaron, speaks to the struggle you've had in the offensive line, mm-hmm. you know, with some of the injuries and things there. So, but again, he's a guy on Sunday you got to worry about, especially in this game. He tends to play very well against Atlanta. It's almost like even the homecoming game is in New Orleans, not just Atlanta, right? So mm-hmm. it'll be fun to watch. Yeah. Two receivers on both sides dealing with some injuries. Drake London left mm-hmm. the game early last week. Chris Olave for the Saints leaving yeah. the game early. That's been concerning, I think, for a lot of people on the Saints side that he's had now two con- concussions. Sure. How is Drake doing? What's his status for this upcoming game? Um, I haven't seen the injury report today as we tape this. Mm-hmm. Um, my guess is he will be a game time decision when we get there. Um, when Atlanta lands on Saturday or Friday when the last declaration is made, my guess is that the folks that cover the league, the insiders, will tell you that they'll probably work him out and see if he's ready to go, and they'll make the decision, you know, before 90 minutes before kickoff. That would be my guess. Um, or he may be, you know, Friday afternoon. I guess there's a chance if he doesn't feel it on Friday morning that they'll go ahead and call him out. But if he can play, he's going to play. He's um, – and we've all been blessed at this at this job to see incredible athletes. Drake London's in my top eight. I mean, he is like, I had Calvin Johnson, as you know, in college. I saw Julio Jones here. Drake London is every bit as athletic as Calvin Johnson and Julio Jones. It's Mm -hmm. unbelievable. Like what he did Sunday on the play he got hurt on, he, he wasn't, you know, taking a touchdown away from a tuna fish can down there. That's a real guy he was playing against. And so, you know, his athleticism is something Atlanta sorely needs if they want to make a run at this thing as the season goes on. So that's why I say that I think it may be a game time decision because you got to think about Sunday, but you also have to think about it in the perspective that Atlanta has to go to Denver next week before they get to their bye. And how valuable is Drake London, not just these two weeks, but when you get back from the bye going down the stretch? Well, and now the Falcons lead the division by two games. So they're sitting. I don't, I don't want to see, you know, I don't even want to say it. They're sitting pretty in, in the division right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, that's yeah. Right now can, with, and, you can sit him and, for this one. 
<laughs> but here's the other thing too. Atlanta's in a unique spot too, Aaron, because they've only got one game left in the division. Yeah. And it's week seven, week 18 against the Panthers. I mean, the division thing is really, really weird. I mean, Dallas came in here last Sunday. They had played one division game. Yeah, it's weird because I feel like the NFC South games were stacked early for everybody. Correct. Yeah. So it, it makes it tough when you are going through a, a rough stretch as we did with injuries right. to be front loaded or, you know, have a lot of games at the beginning. It, but see, it's not always been like that. So I wonder no. if not only do they rotate the schedule, they rotate the division games. Because mm. I remember when this first started, I guess six or eight years ago, it was when Peyton Manning was playing. I remember that because the question was Peyton Manning didn't like play the last two games of the regular season or something for the Colts, right? And then they started backloading member games. They backloaded schedules with division games because they wanted it to be People impactful play, football. Yeah. yeah. And um, Atlanta has one left, and we're not to Thanksgiving. There have been yeah. times where the Falcons have had seasons where they played – I want to say division games in three of their last five weeks. And to your point, I think New Orleans, you're exactly right. Part of the deal with New Orleans has been the injuries. And you guys have already played a, a handful of division games too. You haven't played them all either. You know, mm -hmm. what New Orleans has one left after Sunday. Is that right? Or two? Yeah, we'll have the Bucks. And, and that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, here are two teams playing. This will be their fifth division game of the six. And now all of a sudden, kind of the you know, the cake is made a little bit. Right. But and and without knowing New Orleans schedule off the top of my head, Atlanta has still has games with Minnesota and Washington left to go. In addition to like Chargers, Giants, people like that on the other crossovers. But to your point, you're right. The division games can sometimes bite you if you're not healthy at the front end. Atlanta, fortunately, for the most part, has been. They lost the center, Drew Dahlman, ironically, in the New Orleans game. Haven't been able to get him back yet. Troy Anderson, who had the pick, also lost in the New Orleans game. And he hadn't been back, although hey, he did practice last week and was a scratch at, uh, on the inactive list. Well, we've been without our center for a while, too, so uh, no sympathies here. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I totally have been understand. hearing some chatter about Kirk Cousins' comeback player of the year yeah, you buy that? Sure. Yeah, I would. I mean, if that's what, you know, he went out in week eight last year um, with the Achilles and obviously has come back and, and had really a terrific year. But I, I tell you, he's one of those guys whose impact is bigger than just the stats. Um, he has been uh, really part of what I call the positive reinforcement of Raheem Morris. I think Raheem, because of his working knowledge on those games we were talking about, the 11 he coached here as the interim in 20. I think Raheem came in here and Terry Fontenot, and they talked about Kirk, and they got Kirk in here. And his culture building has been really, really impressive. I mean, to the point that you think about it just in, like, the way he bonds with his teammates. Mm -hmm. I mean, little things that happen. And, you know, you hear stories about, like this voice memo. He's big on voice memos to guys in text. And apparently, you know, he'll think of something. And next thing you know is it's a voice memo text to somebody. And they come at all times. And, you know, I, I think little things like that, though, have made a big thing. And I'll say this, too. You know, I was fortunate to, to be here for the 14-year run of Matt Ryan. And then we had two years in what I'm calling, like, quarterback no man's land with Mariota, Desmond Ritter, Taylor Heineke, all good guys, seemingly, but not the quarterback play you had had with Matt Ryan. Kirk has quickly brought Atlanta back to that expectation level at quarterback. Now, it hasn't been perfect by his definition or anybody else's, but the way that he and Raheem have kind of come in here and worked in lockstep at positive reinforcement, I think has really, really benefited this team when, you know what, when you start out with a loss at home, at to, home Pittsburgh, to Pittsburgh, you, you go to Philly and win in comeback fashion, and then you lose at home to Kansas City, a lot of things can happen in that light. But mm -hmm. they were able to kind of hang in there together and battle through some early bumps and bruises to to kind of get the offense settled in with Zach Robinson, which I also think was critical too. This is going to be an interesting game this weekend. There is a lot that's been going on this week on our side 
And I know that you guys are aware of how that may impact things this weekend. And it's just always an intense game when it comes to the Falcons and the Saints. Why it's the Falcons and Saints, Aaron. It's college. (laughs) Take care. Thank you so much. You bet. Appreciate Wes taking the time to listen to all of Coach Rizzi's press conference following the first day of practice. You can head to NewOrleansSaints.com. All of that is there as well as thoughts from Derek Carr and the full injury report. I'll be back with another podcast for you on Friday as we continue towards this weekend's game against the Atlanta Falcons. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Saints podcast. Join us three times per week on NewOrleansSaints.com the Saints mobile app, or you can download the podcast on iTunes. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Saints podcast.